This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Taylor Riggs. The whole world is changing because of the coronavirus, but for Raytheon Technologies, it's changing for a second reason as well. As it emerges as a new company today, coming out of the merger of Raytheon and United Technologies, we now welcome the chairman and CEO of Raytheon Technologies, Greg Hayes, over the phone. Greg, thank you to, uh, for, for joining us here. Wondering just on your initial thoughts of if now really is a good time to be completing the merger, how do you feel about it? Well, Taylor, first of all, thanks for uh, for having me on. And just one quick correction on the CEO. Uh, Dr. Kennedy will remain chairman of the uh, of the combined entities. But look, it's a it's it's a, a terrible time, obviously, in the country, a terrible time in the world of what's happening with the COVID-19 pandemic. But the rationale for putting these two big businesses together was to create an aerospace and defense uh, technology powerhouse. That is to put two companies together who are strong in both the commercial aerospace and on the, the military defense side of the business, and to be able to combine our businesses and most importantly, our engineering talent to deliver innovative solutions for the next generation of products. So bad time, sure. But again, it's, it's, it's a great time for, for us to come together and get working on, on what's next. Uh, this is Michael McKee. Uh, question is, not so much what's next, but when's next? You're big in aerospace, but nobody's <laughs> flying right now. Nobody wants airplanes. Uh, when do you get back to being able to make money on these things to, to produce? Well, that's, uh, I think, the, the $64,000 question, and I don't have a, a specific answer for you. All I can tell you is having lived through the collapse of air traffic after 9-11, having seen the declines in 2008, 2009, all I know with certainty is that it will come back at some point, uh, probably not quickly. I think we see that in China today where industrial production is picking back up, but people are still reluctant to get on airplanes. Um, you know, departures in China are down 60 percent in March, even with industrial production coming back. So my own view, uh, you're not going to see a recovery in air traffic until people feel safe to fly. And that means uh, you know, the COVID ep epidemic pandemic needs to peak and then and then trough and a vaccine has to be put in place people have to feel safe um, how long is that you know it, it's probably not this year we're, we're probably not going to see a recovery uh, but things will get better and uh, we are here for the long haul you know our products have life cycles of 30 40 years we've got engines out there flying that have been around forever so I think it's it's, it's a matter of time, and we're just going to make sure that we're well positioned when we do come out of this to be stronger and, and ready for the next generation of aircraft. You know, Greg, always in times of a merger, and more importantly, during these times of an economic downturn, there are always discussions about cost cuts, um, trying to reduce some of the inefficiencies. Are you seeing any short-term cost cuts as you now really evaluate the merger and then more importantly try to plan and save any cash flow that you have as we look to be entering now a, a downturn? Yeah, it's interesting, Taylor. I think as you think about the two companies come together, obviously liquidity is the first question people ask. And we have a very strong balance sheet. We've got about $7 billion of cash on day one. We've got access to $5 billion in, in credit facilities. Um, so we're in good position, and if you think about two thirds of our business this year will be in the defense space. Uh, we got a seventy billion dollar backlog there, plenty of work to do there. Um, about three weeks ago, we actually started on the commercial side, that is the Collins Aerospace and the Pratt business. Now they both have big military businesses, but on their commercial aerospace piece, we have cut back on spending. We're reducing capital expenditures, we're reducing engineering, all the discretionary spending, all those things that. that just kind of running the playbook. At the same time, with the merger today, we're also looking for ways to move production facilities, production folks, and engineering folks over to work on some of the Raytheon programs. You know, Raytheon ended last year with a book to bill over 1.5. Had another really good first quarter here. So there's lots and lots of work that make up that $70 billion combined backlog. So we're going to cut costs on the commercial side, just like we you would expect. But we're actually trying to do what we can to protect the workforce in the short term, because as I said before, we will come out of this and, and having a great workforce and protecting that workforce is of paramount importance. There's now a pot of money out there for industries that are important to national defense. You certainly qualify. Uh, are you going to apply for any loans from the government? 
No, I don't think, you know, as we, we've obviously been studying the liquidity of the combined companies, but, you know, given the uh, the cash flows from the defense side of the business, uh, given the uh, the cash on the balance sheet, given available credit facilities, I don't think there's any need for us. In fact, um, maybe the one thing that we, sh we should mention is we probably, well, I know for sure we're going to cut back on share buyback this year. We still believe we can have a strong dividend. Um, again, I think that just a testament to the fact that the defense side of our business is so strong uh, and cash flows are so good, we can, uh, we'll power through this. Are you suspending share buybacks uh, permanently for the rest of the year? You know, I, I, I can't tell you the answer to that today. All I would tell you is uh, we're not going to be doing anything for now. I think what we're waiting to see from both Boeing and Airbus, our two big customers, as well as some of the business jet manufacturers, what their production plans will look like for the next 18 months or so. Um, are the airlines also, of course, uh, will be curtailing spending as they curtail um, their flight schedules. So I think you know, we need to really understand the demand better before we, we decide if we're going to get back into the, the share buyback market. Clearly, the, the business over the long term will have great cash flows. We had talked about 18 to $20 billion of return to capital over the first three years. Yeah, that's probably going to get pushed out a year um, with all of this turmoil. But again, the fundamentals underlying the business are, are remain strong. You get most of your revenue from the United States, which is understandable given the business that you're in. But you do have overseas businesses and you do sell into Asia. And I'm wondering, China, the rest of Asia, what's the visibility there right now, given the situation there, particularly in China? Well, as I mentioned, you know, the air traffic in China is down 60 percent. Uh, we have some uh, overhaul and repair shops in China. Uh, obviously, that uh, that business is slow. The inductions are slow because people aren't flying. Um, you know, we, the, what we see in the U.S. is really uh, what we see around the world uh, is just a complete slowdown in, in air traffic. And, you know, it's, you know, people are closing borders. It's not unexpected that you would see this. But, again, I think that... If, as we think about 2001, after after the 9/11 attacks, the, the aerospace market, you know, it, it literally collapsed because nobody wanted to fly because they didn't feel safe. It took roughly two years to get back to pre-9/11 levels, so almost to uh, the beginning. I think that was of 2004 when we finally saw really solid growth again. I expect we're going to see a similar trajectory here, and I've told our folks to plan for kind of a a two-year tough spell here um, because again, the markets around the world are, are similar to what we're seeing here in the U.S. Is a two-year tough spell, does that go along with the lines of customers like Boeing and Airbus? I mean, what are you hearing from them about the duration and the depth of this slowdown and then concurrently the impact then back to you? Right, so we, we've obviously been having discussions all along with Boeing and Airbus, and I won't speak for them. They're, they're, they are still trying, I would say, to, to help us figure all of that out from a demand standpoint. And, you know, you've got to go airline to airline and see what the airlines are planning to do in terms of c capacity cutbacks, uh, in terms of, you know, how many airplanes are they going to take this year, how many planes are they going to take next year. Um, there's plenty of work to do in the backlog. Um, and I don't expect to see a lot of cancellations. I think what you're going to see, just like you did in, after 9-11 and after the financial crisis, you may see some deferrals. And I suspect in the next two or three weeks, Boeing and Airbus will have a much better view of that, which will inform us in terms of what we need to do on the, on the production floor. For right now, we've tried to keep the factories open because almost all the factories not only have a commercial aerospace component, but also have a, a defense-related component. So... Um, again, it's important to keep the factories open to keep our workforce safe, um, and that's, a, that's the current challenge. But uh, I think another month before we really understand what the demand picture is going to look like. Our thank you there to Raytheon Technology CEO Greg Hayes. And coming up, President Trump says he now has a problem with 3M. We'll talk with its CEO, Mike Roman, about what's gone wrong in a relationship that we thought was working. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Taylor Riggs here alongside with Michael McKee. Michael, earlier we were talking about the jobs report, but you were also in one of your many hats that you wear alongside co-anchor, also covering the Fed. Walk us through again sort of the programs that the Fed has started, the liquidity, and then I do want to get to that Main Street lending facilities well, which we are still waiting on. Well, the Fed has stepped in with a lot of programs to keep the plumbing of the system going, lending to uh, companies through various uh, and, and uh, dealers to, through various facilities uh, for commercial paper, which is only just getting started. So we haven't seen spreads come down there as much, but also buying corporate bonds for the first time, which is raising questions about what happens with the Main Street program and with the other lending programs that the Fed are going to be uh, working on with the Treasury Department. Uh, there is a law that says the Fed can't lose money, mm -hmm. and so their programs are all to buy bonds at this point that are investment grade. You can't go below investment grade, but there's arguments being made that the Fed should look at companies that have a sort of systemic importance to the economy but are junk rated like Macy's, laid off 130,000 people. Uh, what happens if they don't get financing? Is that going to be a problem for 130,000 people who are without jobs? So some issues for the Fed to talk about going forward. And Mohammed Al Arian earlier this morning around 9, 9.30 a.m. or so also highlighted that risk that beware of fallen angels. The biggest risk right now is that credit spreads go wider or credit risk goes lower than the Fed's tolerance. And then you have that problem with the investment grade bonds that then are downgraded into the junk category. And the Fed is uh, assuming the responsibility for financing the loans that uh, banks are making and taking on these bonds as collateral. So who has the ultimate responsibility for paying them off if they go bad? Does the Fed have to take on the losses? Do the banks take on the losses? That's going to be a contentious issue. And that's one reason the Fed would really like to stay out of it at this point. And that's a question with the Main Street lending program as well. Uh, what, who's responsible for the loans in terms of the bottom line at the end? And what level of credit do you need? What sort of confidence does a bank have to have in order to give you money? Well, along with some of the economics that we've been discussing, I wanted to look over to New York and New Jersey. They now, of course, do have the highest number of coronavirus cases, but Michigan ranks fourth. We welcome now Democratic Senator Gary Peters of Michigan. Gary, give us a tone on the ground. How do things uh, feel there for you in Michigan? Well, it's, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, certainly, uh, Michigan has become a, a hot spot, uh, the city of Detroit uh, in particular. But if you look at our hospitals, both in the city of Detroit as well as the surrounding areas like Oakland County, uh, they are approaching uh, capacity. So it's a very uh, concerning uh, situation. And uh, we're also very concerned by the fact that uh, we just don't have adequate supplies of personal protection equipment, which is absolutely critical to keep our health care providers uh, healthy. Uh, we, we need them on the job, and we need to keep them safe and uh, we've been working aggressively to get more uh, personal protection equipment here. Uh, this is Michael McKee. Uh, the administration claims that they're the backup for the states, that the states should have been out there stockpiling stuff early on. Um, there is an argument, a federalism argument, that the states should be in charge of these things. Uh, we saw New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo say a little bit ago that, that that's out the window right now, that uh, we need federal help. We need the federal government in charge. Which side do you come down on? Well, we, we do need to make sure that there's somebody who, who's in charge and is taking responsibility and making sure that uh, personal protection equipment is getting to those hot spots. You know, right now we have a shortage of uh, PPE. There's a tremendous demand across the country. Folks uh, want to stockpile on this. And unfortunately now you have states basically bidding uh, against each other and you've got a bidding war that's driving up prices instead of uh, doing it in a, in a thoughtful, coordinated fashion. And then when you have hot spots, uh, it becomes particularly problematic if there is uh, inadequate supply. In my mind, we've got to look at this as a triage situation. When, when you're dealing triage in a hospital or medical facility, the, uh, if the patients uh, are overwhelming the, uh, the facility, you figure who is the sickest, uh, who can we save. You provide resources to there in a triage. The same thing has to be happening with states uh, right now. You've got certain areas that are hot spots. They need equipment. Uh, we do know that more PPE is going to be produced. Uh, we're seeing the companies here in Michigan, for example, General Motors and Ford and Chrysler and others are going to be in the uh, personal protection equipment business, but it takes some time for that to come online. In the meantime, the limited sources that are out there right now, we've got to apply to those areas in the greatest need 
understanding that this additional supply will be coming online in the weeks ahead. Senator, I have to ask, how is your ever important auto sector faring? Well, it's uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, shuttered now. We're really concerned about the, the supply chain. That's why it's uh, critically important for us to make sure that we're helping uh, our second and third year uh, second tier uh, suppliers to make sure that they continue to to have the wherewithal when we start up production again. We've got to have a, a supply chain that's uh, operating and is open, and that means uh, making sure that our, our smaller suppliers uh, have the resources they need to, to be able to start up once things start turning around. Our thank you there to Democratic Senator Gary Peters of Michigan. Now, 3M produces those N95 masks needed so badly by healthcare workers fighting the coronavirus. And it's been ramping up production. But yesterday, President Trump said he was invoking the Defense Production Act directed at 3M. Joining us now on the phone is 3M Chairman and CEO Mike Roman. Mike, talk to me a little bit about what happened. Our colleagues have been speaking to you in the last few weeks. Things felt fine. What happened in the last few days? Yeah, Taylor, thank you for having me on. Michael, good to be here with you today. I, I would start here. We continue to do everything we can to fight COVID-19 and support healthcare workers here at home. We're, we've ramped up our production in the U.S. as quickly as possible. We saw this early in January and, and ramped up production capacity that we keep idle for just these kinds of situations. So we are we are working to expand that. We're focused on delivering as much as we can in April. And the narrative overnight that we're not doing everything to maximize the delivery of respirators in our home country is false. It, nothing could be further from the truth. And, and the idea that 3M is not doing all it can to fight price gouging and unauthorized reselling is absurd. And I, we have been at the front lines of, of really leading this as we've gone through it. So I, that narrative is, you know, for all the framers that have dedicated so much time and effort to, to really lead the fight here, uh, it was disappointing to hear that narrative overnight. It's always uh, hard to know exactly what the White House is talking about, uh, but in this case, it seems that the president heard a report that you are selling some of these masks to Canada and into Latin America, which, uh, as I understand it, has been a common business practice for you. Yeah, we have, under normal circumstances, we produce about 19 million respirators, 20 million respirators a month in the U.S. 90% of that goes to industrial customers, and a portion of that goes to Canada and Latin America to serve customers there. In a crisis like this, we double that output, and we shift to 90% plus to healthcare, only supporting key industries like pharmaceutical manufacturing or food uh, production. And so we continue to support Canada and Latin America. It's part of our strategy. We have excess capacity to bring online. This COVID fight is like nothing we've seen. It, the demand is so much greater. So we are trying to do everything we can to bring capacity into the U.S. while we still serve Canada and Latin America, where we are often the sole supplier of healthcare workers in those countries. So we have expanded our capacity. We'll ramp up another 5 million respirators in the month of April. We now have just uh, got agreement to be able to export 10 million N95 respirators from our China manufacturing into the U.S. And so we are stepping up and we are bringing more production online in June. So we'll get up to 50 million plus what we can bring from China. So we're a, a net importer into the U.S., even though we continue to serve, serve Canada and Latin America with a small amount of that production. It's less than 10 percent of our normal production. And so it's it is. Uh, it, it becomes a humanitarian issue that we have to try to balance, and, and we are mm -hmm. at the same time maximizing everything we can bring to U.S. healthcare workers. Mike, is there price gouging of some of these masks? How far down the supply chain through the customer, really, are you able to control prices? Yeah, and, and on price gouging, it, it's good to be clear here. We are manufacturing respirators. We sell those to distributors, and in. In the healthcare crisis, we sell through half a dozen large, reputable distributors, and we have a strong partnership. We work with them to get product where it's needed. Your Senator Peter's comment about triage, that's exactly what we're doing. We're triaging to serve the most critical need, working with FEMA to ship directly, but also working with our distributors, distributors to get there. Prior to COVID outbreak, we were selling to 90% to industrial distributors, and they're selling to a broad range of customers. Some of that inventory has ended up in resellers, and those resellers are where this unethical, despicable behavior of, of price gouging is taking place. 
3M, we have not and would never increase prices for our respirators during this crisis. And we don't sell to the highest bidder. We sell through these authorized distributors or directly to the government. And it's, it's beyond that that we go with uh, DOJ and state AGs to really pursue these perpetrators. We, we bring our data online. We help with counterfeits. We authenticate 3M products. We work with e-tailers to make sure we're calling out those price gouging and resellers. So it's, we're doing everything we can to help law enforcement take that on. And we have a supply chain that ensures in this crisis, and we monitor this every day, it, it is really a strong way to, an effective way to get the product to the customer. So that it's, dis, it's, it's disappointing and unfortunate that resellers are out there taking advantage of, of this situation the way they are. Our thank you there to 3M CEO Mike Roman. Now, U.S. jobs numbers were even worse than expected today. 700,000 positions were lost in that data, coming before many of the lockdowns and shelter-in-place orders even began. We welcome now Glenn Hubbard, professor of economics at the Columbia Business School. He served as President George W. Bush's chief economist, and he is a contributor to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Glenn, great to have you. What is your biggest concern as you take a look at the jobs report this morning? Well, I think in some sense that we knew the jobs report wasn't going to be an accurate picture of where we are now because we've seen such a big increase in unemployment insurance claims. But it was worse than one might have expected. And to me, what that says is that policy needs to focus very much on doing whatever it takes to keep people linked to their employment, things like the uh, Paycheck Protection Program and the CARES Act. You were early in calling for assistance to companies, particularly smaller and medium-sized enterprises, but you had envisioned a much bigger program. Do you think Congress is going to have to go back and add more to the small business lending program that's in theory getting underway today? Or maybe can the Fed handle it through the Main Street program once they start leveraging up the Treasury money? Well, it's possible that the Fed can assist, but actually most of this is going to be on the taxpayers' back because, remember, these loans are really grants as long as small and mid-sized firms don't lay off their workers. So I think Congress will have to augment that support uh, in future bills. But frankly, the Treasury Department and the SBA are going to have to redouble their efforts right now to make the program work for banks and borrowers. They're not where they should be. Glenn, it's pretty incredible when we talk about the rate of news flow. I remember waking up on New Year's Day and we were all concerned about rising deficits. Is it correct in thinking that during these times of crisis, we don't care about deficits anymore? I don't think it's don't care, but you have to put them in perspective. I think of the great analogy here is more like war. We have to do what it takes to win this. It's a one-time increase in government debt, and like a war, future growth whittles down that debt. What the goal is is to make sure that we're not wasteful, and I think focusing on keep people in, keeping people in their jobs isn't, isn't wasteful at all, and we need to make sure we don't let this become an occasion to create all new programs going forward. But I don't have a problem with the kind of one-time spending that President Trump and the Congress have done. we got only about a minute left, Glenn, but I'm wondering if you have given any thought to what this economy is going to look like when this is over. Are we going to see something completely different? Well, I think it may take some time, even when the shutdown ends, for people to be comfortable in the travel and hospitality space. We may also see changes in the way work gets conducted, education gets conducted, meetings get conducted. We'll have to see. A lot of that's going to depend on how long this shutdown is, and hopefully not so long. Yeah, hopefully not so long for everyone involved. Our thank you there to Glenn Hubbard of Columbia University. And he is a regular contributor to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. It also airs 6 p.m. Eastern tonight on Bloomberg Television and Radio. And coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. David Weston will be back with you then. We sure didn't miss him this hour. He will be speaking with Labor Secretary Eugene Scalia. This is Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and Radio.